let me welcome everybody. Welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad you're here today. We have a fantastic guest on a vital subject, and I'm really, really delighted to uh, explore. I'm absolutely delighted to bring to the forum Virginia Sapiro. She's a professor of political science at Boston University. And in that capacity, she has been studying, among other things, including voting, she's been studying the history and politics of American higher education. And she published recently a fascinating paper on how and when colleges close. And it's a fantastic document. I really recommend diving into it. Uh, you should have a link to it in the bottom left of your screen. And that includes, among other things, ways of thinking about higher education closures as part of an ecosystem, as well as as part of a life cycle of institutions. It's a very deep paper, which tells us a lot and gives us a lot of direction to go on. Um, and today, we're going to be exploring it. So without any further ado, let me bring Professor Sapiro on stage. Hello. Hey, Welcome. how are you? It's so good to see you. Thank you for coming. Long time no see. Indeed, it's, it's been uh, just, you know, an hour. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's so many ways to introduce um, faculty work in higher education. And for me, my favorite way is to ask you what you're gonna be working on for the next year. What are the big projects, the big ideas, the classes, the papers, the books, the trips? What's what's the next year hold for you? Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Good to meet you all, and I look forward to our conversation. Um, what I'm most looking forward to is retiring on June 30th. Um, and uh, yes, uh, so I can um, uh, for a whole variety of reasons. One of which is so I can. Uh, work on this book a bit more. So let me say a little bit. I think it's important uh, to know that not only um, am I a scholar, I'm a political scientist and a researcher and a teacher, um, but I spell, spent well over a decade in higher education administration. Um, I spent uh, uh, over 30 years on the faculty of the University of Wisconsin-Madison where in my last number of years, I was uh, vice provost for teaching and learning, mm -hmm. and I was interim provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs. And then after that, went over to the dark side and moved to Boston University specifically to become dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So, mm -hmm. uh, so in, in 2015, I went back to the faculty and took up teaching and research again, but one of the major projects that I got involved in was to combine a whole lot of things that I've done uh, for a long time to do a major work on the history of higher education in the US, um, looking at it as a political scientist would, um, as a project of American social and political development. I'm not interested in it for its own sake, but really as it relates to the development of the American state and society. Oh. So the paper that some of you may have seen and, and that frames uh, the conversation we'll have for today is not published. It's really a little working paper um, that I pulled out of a much, much larger project, um, really only because of the fact that in uh, 2018, 2019, people began to notice that uh, there was a spike in the number of institutions that closed. Um, and in Massachusetts in particular, I think people became very, very riveted because of the debacle that was Mount Ida College. Um, uh, we have later had some other examples, a much better one, Wheelock College that combined with my own institution. Um, but what disturbed me and what I'm continuing to work on now is how a historical is the understanding of most people in higher education about our own sector. Um, uh, my sense is that people know bloody little about the history and say some things that are really highly uninformed um, and really understand institutions as all sorts of little individual organizations and not anything that connects with anything else. So. So this working paper was really an effort to pick things out of the news and to frame it as I understand it. So what am I going to do uh, in the next couple of years? Well, part of the reason I decided it was time to retire at the ripe old age of 70 is um, I really want to finish this book, um, which is going to be massive. Wow. Uh, 
um, it, it is based on about four years work in which I collected a set of discrete facts about every institution of higher education in this country and its history that was ever accredited at the baccalaureate or graduate degree. So that little outline is 700 pages. I didn't intend to do that when I started out, <laughs> but I've always been a funky kind of scholar. And once I get into something, I really do it. Um, and so, so this history is gonna be a little different from most of the others because I can actually build it from the ground up and think about institutional histories. Um, so where it's going, um, just so you know, and you can ask me anything about any of this, is I've already done a large section of it, uh, closing in on 150 pages or so, uh, which starts the book on higher education institutions and their communities, mm -hmm. because almost all higher education institutions that were founded up through World War I were founded by and in communities, and so I... I can talk a little bit more about that. I won't do that now. I then turn to state and federal government, but the core of the book, the remainder of the book, will be through a set of chapters to ask a discrete set of questions that I think have, have challenged uh, higher education and determined its history since the beginning in, in the 1630s. And that is higher education, what is it? Who gets it? How is it paid for and supported? What does it benefit? And what does it have to do with the rest of the world? And who gets to be involved? And so that, that those questions are gonna frame the chapters and each one of those will be developed um, in a historical way. So, so there's that. And I, there's some other things, but I guess I'd close by saying I, farm about an acre of my 160 acres up here in New Hampshire. I uh, work in two nonprofits. One is Shelter Music Boston, which sponsors 80 or so classical music concerts in nine, 10 homeless shelters and rehab centers a year in Boston. Mm. And I help to run a little nonprofit farm market that I founded and contribute to. So, so I'll have enough to do. I think you'll have plenty. <laughs> well, I, I would love to see that that book as it grows, and when it's uh, when it's done, when it hits press, we'd love to have you back uh, just to to talk about it. Uh, this is fantastic, uh, friends. This is the part of the program where you all get to take over. I'm just the moderator. I'm just the MC. The forum is for your questions, your comments, and your thoughts. So if you have questions about farmers' markets, we will allow a couple of ones. This is a great time to ask about what happens to the higher education ecosystem, what makes a college close, and how that changes over time, what forces they connect with. And we already have a few questions, and I'll bring up a couple of them right now. Uh, whoops. To begin with, uh, this is one from Phil Katz. Um, not too far from me here, and a longtime friend of the program, He's the Council of Independent Colleges, and he says, how does the analysis of the closure of colleges compare to the analysis of the closure of other cultural institutions, such as museums or other charities? That's a fabulous question. Um, and I only have some some ideas about it from my sideways glances. I've been looking at the history of higher education. I know a lot more about how, how um, colleges and universities and their predecessors were founded in a context of the founding of other institutions, for example, museums and Chautauquas and, mm -hmm. and all sorts of things. Um, I, you know, my, I would really have to be, have to be making guesses. Um, uh, there are a couple of things that come to mind, though. One is neither other cultural institutions nor colleges and universities are paid for by the ticketing of their patrons. In other words, hmm. virtually no college or university has ever survived just on tuition. Mm -hmm. Never has and never will. Um, and that is the same of our as our other cultural institutions, museums, aren't paid for just by those of us who, you know, pay the tab as we walk in, or certainly my ticket to the BSO doesn't support it. Um, uh, 
so all of these institutions, which are public cultural goods, survive and certainly survive at quality oh. only by having important patrons, whether that is private philanthropy or increasingly since the 19th century, the support of government. Um, so I suspect that those other institutions that have have failed just as almost is true of almost every college or university that's failed has done so because the other sources of patronage um, have dried up. And, and, and all of them, I imagine, spend some time trying to figure out the balance between access and what they charge. For us, it's tuition. Uh, having other revenue streams. I bought a set of masks today from the Peabody Essex Museum because I need masks and I prefer to do it in ways that support cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. Universities have all sorts of other things. Uh, uh, you know, they do all sorts of things, but ultimately, if that patronage dri dries up, cultural institutions go down. So that patronage is crucial as is that kind of mixed model of uh, multiple uh, sources of uh, income. Yeah, do you have an idea of the answer? Um, you I, asked it? Oh, uh, Phil asked it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Phil, if you'd like to uh, follow up, just click the uh, raised hand and uh, we can bring you on stage. Um, Phil is a, an awesome fellow, uh, among other things, the background in uh, American history. Um, and we, uh, as gee, he wants to join us. So let's bring him up. Here you go, Phil. Cool. In fact, I'll, I'll use the uh, the fancy video format just to emphasize Phil's coolness. Well, now I see now I see I too much of myself. Um, you know, I am interested in this because I, I also have a background in um, in the cultural world, having worked for the American Alliance of Museums, and there are some really interesting similarities in the history of the development of cultural organizations and the development of nonprofits generally. And we could add to the list of things. Um, nonprofit local hospitals. You might add to the list of things um, church congregations. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do wonder whether the things you're talking about have more similarity to a cluster of of nonprofit organizations, or whether there are affinities with an analysis of businesses that go in and out of of business. I I guess in general, my question is: Is there something unique about the treatment of how we think about the closure of colleges, or are they a subset of some other thing? And if so, what is the what is the superset that they're part of? Mm. I'm going to keep notes on that because it's a question that I'd like to pursue more. I think it's a very important one, um, and partly because you often get folks. You know, I've been on a board of trustees for a university, and I've certainly had to deal with boards of trustees. And very often, you get business people. Um, who will say, you know, these institutions are too important to be left to academics, artists, curators, and so forth. Business people know how to deal with them. And there's a substantial difference between sustaining an institution that's a for-profit revenue organization and a nonprofit. Um, and I and I suspect um, that that you are right because we're talking about institutions that are founded to serve um, and serve in a broad range of ways. We have to be businesslike. I mean, to be a nonprofit doesn't mean that all you're supposed to do is build up debt. Um, but being a nonprofit means core to the value is something other than profit and that they have a good for society that that needs to be supported. Um, so I think those similarities are important. Can I add one more thing to the mix here? And I think Brian got at it a little bit when he talked about sort of the ecosystem of higher education, because that is a really important issue. We're dealing with very locally based organizations and sort of cultural organizations as well. And we're talking national, you know, ecosystems. So I know that when you talk about something like an art museum, we'll go to the cultural sector. You know, there are some really interesting debates about what happens when you have 
you know, say an art museum and a symphony and an opera company designed for a city of several millions like Detroit, which is now a city of several hundred thousands instead. Um, and how does that issue of sort of carrying capacity and national contribution, you know, play into these issues? And I don't have an answer for that, but I think it's a really important, you know, um, consideration going from the the scale of the one institution which of course those who work there and go there and love those institutions that's vital to them but there's also a larger national context i smile when you mention detroit because my father is from there and my uncle was the kind of house pianist for the detroit symphony when they didn't have anybody imported wow. um you know, again, I think that's really crucial. There are there are institutions of higher education, say in the 19th century, that began to develop beautifully, but then the railroad was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the waterway got silted up, the town failed, and the institution failed. Um, but likewise, in the late 19th century, and I was just writing about this because of the chapter on on, communi on communities birthing and nurturing institutions is, you know, if you know the rest of the nonprofit sector, you probably know very well that, that many of those institutions which, and hospitals, which started out independent in the 19th century, found that they could no longer support themselves and hustled to be eaten up by an institution of higher education that certainly happened to hospitals. Um, where most of them found that they could not support themselves anymore. And they, and especially after a national report that just slammed the quality of American healthcare, they hustled to find a, a, a university to adopt them. Um, theaters um, in Boston, a good example is the constant relationship between the Huntington Theater and Boston University or between a piece of Tanglewood and Boston University where, uh, you know, all sorts of questions that affect the nonprofit. So I think it's great to open with that, with that link, because I think you're absolutely right. We have, while we have to be business-like, we have more in common with other nonprofits and cultural institutions than with a pharma company. At the same time, I, I should say before, Brian takes me down uh, here, yeah, takes me off the screen, not takes me down. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as um, you know, someone who works for the Council of Independent Colleges, we like to point out, I'll point out here, that of course the average age of a college that goes out of business is decades, decades longer than the average age of a business that goes out of business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a real difference between um, a Silicon Valley startup that flames out in three years and a small college that gives you 150 years before it closes. So it's always important to keep that uh, comparison in mind. Sure, sure. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. And I, I'm not going to pull you off of the hook. I'm just going to thank you. Um, uh, for everybody who is, uh, who is new uh, to the forum, uh, this is an, you've now seen both examples of, of how we have conversations. Uh, you've seen a question that popped up. And you've also seen a questioner pop up. And you can do either of those, either by clicking the raised hand button or the question button. Uh, and, and Professor Shapiro, thank you for that very, very deep answer. Uh, I actually have played in the Youth Symphony at uh, Detroit's Orchestra Hall once, so your, your father, that memory just makes me very happy. Uh, we have a whole stack of questions. I want to give people a chance to bring them up. One comes from Kiel uh, Douche, longtime friend of the program, and he asked, I'd like Dr. Shapiro's view of the role of higher ed's degree or job credential monopoly and credential inflation in artificially sustaining demand, which is now threatened by alternative credential. I'm going to put that back up on the screen because that was a deep question. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And one of those questions, when I said that, that, that the book is going to be framed around a set of essential questions, the what's it for and what it achieves, um, your question fits in there. And it's really, it's really one that's troubled higher education since, since the very beginning. Um, what's it for? What is it credential? Um, and especially toward the end of the 19th century, as it became much more a credentialing system than it had been earlier. Hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I find very interesting is it, it's really very recent 
for both colleges and universities and American society generally to understand colleges and university largely in their credentialing. That's not what it was for the first couple of hundred years. And there is no essential reason why um, colleges or universities uh, should even have a monopoly on the credentialing for much of the um, American economy. Uh, all sorts of pressures led to that inflation that you were talking about, um, uh, plenty of professions from the 19th century that you got into or one got into because of a, for apprenticeship, you didn't do a program for it. Uh, slowly colleges and universities um, offered alternatives as for medicine, business, pharmacy, a whole bunch of things. Um, and eventually they began law. And, and uh, universities eventually became basically the sole accreditors, um, especially in the post-World War II period. Um, I frankly think that's nuts. I think it devalues really what a college education can be for. Um, and it leads to a lot of people feeling like they need a particular kind of higher education that they might not really need. Hmm. Um, and could use something else entirely for, for credentialing. Um, so I think we still have to sort that out once again. Um, what do you need a bachelor's degree for? Uh, why is it once upon a time to be an occupational therapist, you needed to apprentice, and then you needed two years plus apprenticing, and then you needed a four-year program. And then when I was provost at the University of Wisconsin, uh, the occupational therapy program told us you could no longer get a job in occupational therapy unless you had a master's degree. Later, they said a PhD. And they took exactly the same program characteristics, nothing different, nothing upgraded, and then petitioned to have it called first a master's degree and then a PhD. So we have professional PhDs. Um, the whole, how do we balance uh, this is something I know we're all dealing with at different institutions. Hmm. How do we balance an understanding that that higher education, especially of the liberal arts and sciences part, the training of the mind, the expansion of exposure um, to cultures, to literature, and understanding of the workings of science, of the arts. How do we balance a view that 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 kind of education needs to be made accessible, mm -hmm. meaning available and affordable, mm -hmm. because high school's not doing it. And we need to make proper credentialing programs accessible. Um, but we shouldn't be wasting the time and the resources of institutions and people by forcing them through the garlic press where they don't need to be. One of my big fears is whenever any of us say, well, you don't need this credentialing, it sounds to people like saying, not everybody needs college. Right. You know, we do need aspects of that. And it's too little accessible, not too much accessible. But we've gone kind of nuts with credentialing. Thank you for that great answer. One last thing, by the way, one of the things that we're doing in colleges and universities, and all of you associated with them have seen this, is we've injected more sensible aspects, but not something that's accessible for all our students, in increasing the amount of hands-on and in, an internship work we offer, right? So that even in liberal arts and sciences degrees, we've integrated much more hands-on work, um, internship work, apprenticeship work, because we've recognized that neither apprenticeship alone nor, quote, classroom education alone gives us everything we need. The problem is it's not accessible because we still structure it in a way where only our wealthier students and better resourced students can afford to take a lot of those opportunities for a whole variety of reasons we could talk about. Likewise, international study. Mm -hmm.
mostly only our wealthiest students can afford to do that the way most of our institutions structure that. Well, this, this is a great question, Kiel. Uh, and and um, Gina, thank you for taking that in several key directions. Um, I, I want to make sure that we have a few other questions uh, because they're coming in thick and fast. <laughs> and they come from different angles. Uh, thanks to Phil and thanks to Kiel for these questions. Uh, we have one from across the Atlantic, uh, and this is from uh, Professor Donald Clark at the University of Derby. Uh, he asks, colleges are sorry, closures are error corrections, population shifts, demographics, etc. But as a number of institutions have grown, error corrections grow. So are closures small here? I'm not sure I'd call them error corrections. I, there's market response. And that's not an error correction. If, if the world changes, the world changes. And if the market is no longer there, the market is no longer there. Um, and, and most of the closures I've seen, um, the market has left sometimes long ago. And it's less an error correction and more obsolescence. Um, you know, let me give you an example. Uh, what's its name? Evergreen college or whatever it was in Vermont. Oh, right. Yeah. Great in its time, little she, she place actually brought in mostly pretty wealthy students who were confident enough and thought they could afford to go. And their parents thought they could afford to go to a college where they could study ecology and sing Kumbaya. And, you know, they were way out in front. Um, it's closed because there was no national market. And it's not because there was no national market for students studying ecology. It's just there's piles of institutions that do that better and actually have science in the curriculum and actually have good interdisciplinary studies. So, you know, uh, Evergreen existed for a while because there was a purpose for it, but, but there wasn't any more. So it's not you know, it's small beer, as you say. Luckily, I'm married to a Brit, so I know what that means. Um, it's small beer if all you're doing is looking at it from a market point of view. Uh, it happens. But when an institution of higher education closes, it's not small beer because you have people who lose their jobs. You have a community that loses people who would be living there otherwise. You have shops that close, you have restaurants that close, you have the ethos of a town that is altered tremendously by the loss of any major cultural institution. So I wouldn't go as far as small beer and I wouldn't say it's, it's um, you know, just error correction. It's It's something, deeper that has to do with markets and ecologies of institutions and communities. Thank you. Uh, Donald, appreciate the question. Um, and Donald also has a fantastic avatar of himself that he uses, which is really disturbing. Um, and it was uh, uh, Evergreen, excuse me, it was Green Mountain College. Green Mountain. I knew it had green. Yep, well, that's, you know, I'm in New Hampshire. What do I know about Vermont? I'm not going to go down that road. I, I, it's too dangerous. But, but we have we have more. Thank you uh, again, Gina, for the answers to that. We have uh, another question that comes back to uh, both Phil and uh, Kiel's, which is from a colleague of mine at Georgetown who asks, if credentialing is a reason that philanthropy contributes to higher ed to help the ex-youth get their employment, if higher ed loses that monopoly, does it then also lose philanthropic support? So um, at BU, while I was dean, I was responsible for raising $100 million during our campaign. And almost none of that came from people who are were narrowly interested in credentialing. Mm -hmm. They uh, most of the people who actually gave to this nonprofit institution, yes, they wanted our students to be able to find jobs later, and they wanted to prepare them, but. Uh, they wanted skill building, they wanted opportunities, they wanted a whole variety of places and things. And most of the, uh, the institutions that have done best in their development, other than the portion that is the business school, mm -hmm. and maybe the portion that's the engineering school, 
are interested in the broader sense, not of credentialing, but of skill building or opportunities or whatever. Hmm. The institutions that are most narrowly focused on credentialing and employment preparation tend not to attract a lot of philanthropy, though they may get grants and not a lot of philanthropists. If people really wanted to donate to institutions that were credentialing, they would give a lot more to community colleges. Mm. Mm. Yes. Those are credentialing. Yep. Um, you know, they serve two purposes, basically. One is to prepare students for four-year colleges, and the other is to prepare people for job market and credentialing. And so they'd be great places for people to donate. But that's not where philanthropy goes in education. And if they really wanted to donate well, it wouldn't be so easy for Harvard and Stanford to do philanthropy. It would be much easier for a lot of other institutions that are more likely to contribute to upward mobility than those two institutions, which are unlikely to contribute very much to upward mobility. Oh, fascinating. Um, great question. Um, Not that I'm biased against Harvard and Stanford. Another but, geographical uh, collision. Thank you, John Henry. Um, and uh, we had the, um, a couple more questions that point towards the future. I'm going to save those. But a question for the present. Um, we have one from the awesome Sarah San Gregorio. Uh, she's at Montclair State, where she's finished her PhD and doing a thousand things at once because she's brilliant that way. And she asks about a concept that I've coined. So I'm going to ask the question and then I'll explain it for you. Uh, we're seeing more press on queen sacrifices happening because of COVID related financial exigencies. Is an increase of these personnel moves a commentary on the outlook of colleges as a whole? Uh, and the concept of queen sacrifice refers to when a college or university removes tenure track faculty, um, using the analogy from chess, where tenure track faculty are like the queens on the board. So to you know to put that back up, you know, is is this a commentary? Seeing these happen, is this a commentary on the outlook of colleges as a whole? Um, so the only thing I know about uh, chess comes from the Queen's Gambit. Um, so so let me make sure I understand this. Is is are you talking about here the moving away from tenure track faculty to adjunct faculty? Or I'm not. I've never heard the term, so I'm trying oh. to. It just refers to when a uh, college terminates tenure track faculty, um, oh. not not because of individual personnel issues, but because yeah. of financial exigency or because they're closing a program. Um, there are not many institutions that have terminated uh, tenured faculty. Usually, what they will do is terminate tenured faculty positions. Mm -hmm that occur naturally, for example, in one of the many moves that the Wisconsin State Legislature did to try to starve its university system. Again, I, I don't want to sound biased about what, what the state government did, but uh, when we had to figure out what to do, especially when they did that in the middle of a year, um, we had to restrict somehow. We did not fire tenured faculty. Um, we selectively figured out positions where when people left, they would not be replaced. Um, that's happened much more often, mostly the institutions that have ended up firing any tenured faculty are in the process of shutting down. That's a, that's a good, that's a, that's a clear answer. Thank you. The most recent example we've got is from Western Oregon University where they, uh, uh, closed their philosophy major and minor, uh, laid off four tenured professors, and also removed uh, 11 non-tenured faculty members. Yeah, yeah. The removal of tenured faculty is, is uh, all, well, the restructuring and reducing the quality and extent of the educational programs is a desperation act, and many folks have gotten into desperation acts of finding ways of restricting, you know, you, you can't go beyond your budget. Yeah. Um, you can you can spend some time eating. It. The other thing that's more common is in any institution that has an endowment to begin to eat the principal. They'll do that first, usually. Um, but firing tenured faculty, if if it's an institution that depends on tenured faculty and especially a research institution, that will surely take a spiral. 
because tenured faculty are not uh, are there to teach, but tenured faculty also contribute to the prestige of the institution in other ways. They contribute to revenue in other ways, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, they contribute to subvention of part of the program by bringing in grants. So that doesn't happen as much. What happens more is um, shucking staff, mm -hmm. which contrary to a lot of business people out there who talk about us tightening our belts, usually means we're reducing services to students. Mm -hmm. Almost always means we're reducing services to students. They will reduce adjunct faculty and contingent faculty which almost always means increasing class size and reducing options, um, but not as much tenured faculty. I love this exchange between the two of you, Sarah and Gina, because Sarah, your question is such a, a detailed, precise probe. And Gina, not only did you answer it, but you also gave us a sketch about some of the different, uh, should we say, autumnal phases that a college can go through on its way to a winter. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, we have two questions that build on both of these, and I'll make sure that we, we get them. Uh, uh, Joellen Parker, a dear friend, and uh, also uh, an incredibly experienced thoughtful leader of education, she follows on Sarah's question and asks, has Professor Sapero looked at institutions that stay open, but only by changing their nature? Sure, the, and, and there's a long history of, of that, of institutions um, we've seen some, let's just take the current area. There, there, there are plenty in the 19th century, but the current era moving from um, in-person classes to online classes, um, moving from serving um, an undergraduate population of the normative age to serving adults. Um, that, that has become very common. I've seen a couple, I can't remember who, but in the last couple of years, um, that's often a step before closure, but um, in doing those kinds of things, in shucking uh, liberal arts and sciences programs and thinking that you can survive if you look useful and, and um, keep only the programs in uh, more applied subjects. Ask Becker College about that and how it's going for them. Um, yeah, so so there's that's one of the many many um, ways people uh, institutions can go about reconceiving what they do. Very often they'll add before they totally shift. Um, so all of the programs in adult education, as as institutions saw that that the population of the normative student age was going to begin to shrink, we knew that was going to happen. Of course, many places did what they could to try to attract m more people who were older than that. Um, around World War II, there are whole bunches of institutions that were on track to, to um, close because of the impact of the Depression. Mm -hmm. And the war saved them because they contracted with the federal government and became very involved in war training. So. Um, uh, institutions that are good on their feet will look like other organizations will look at good opportunities for, sh for keeping their educational mission, but doing it in a different way. Speaking of which, we have a question that's a perfect, perfect uh, connection to that. Excuse me. Uh, this is from Mark Corbett Wilson um, out on the West Coast. And Mark asks, any thoughts about elders wanting further education? and the impossible requirements of this certification of contemporary university. Um, I'm a great fan of institutions that open up to elders. Um, maybe I should be because I'm an elder now. But, but for many years, I participated. For example, at Wisconsin in the, in the program uh, they had for the community, and uh, BU has it, lots of places have it, where um, classes that have seats uh, the professor can give permission for a certain number of elders from the community to to take the course, uh, often at some reduced amount of tuition. Um, but we certainly have that. And I love those programs. And I've always loved having some elders. Um, if we had more time, I would tell you a wonderful story about that. But um, I've, I've loved having age-integrated classrooms, although sometimes elders are a little 
hard to control. Um, but, uh, you know, they're generally not looking for credentials. They're looking for learning. I've had people who've spent their, their careers in finance and now they want to take my course on gender politics and history because it's something new to them. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark, for the great question. And thank you uh, for the heartfelt answer. So that's one way forward. Um, we uh, also had a question um, that uh, comes from the uh, excellent Michael Haggins, who asks clearly, what do you, to what extent do you think the small scale or size contributes to closures? I don't know what small is. I, I mean, it depends. It's. Yeah. The, the real question is the, the structure and the finances of a particular institution, what it takes to sustain it. Um, what, what often happens is that, that an institution is retracting and it gets to a point where it's too small to survive. Uh -huh. um, there are institutions that have attempted to go in the other direction and, it, and try to bring in more and more. Mm -hmm. Students, especially those, for example, who have gone online, and that is not always as successful because they're competing with other kinds of organizations. So I, I think it's more a matter of the mix of, of the mission, the resources, and how many people it takes to be sustainable. Um, you know, how many... How much, again, how much support outside of tuition dollars hmm. is there? Thank you. Uh, good question, Michael. Thank you. Uh, we also have a very friendly question, I think, from uh, Sally Mudiamu at Portland State. Uh, and uh, Sally asks, do you have any comments on David Larrabee's book, The Perfect Mess, which argues that U.S. higher ed has always been in flux and threatened, and that is what makes it resilient? And just as a quick note, we had David as a guest um, a couple of months ago, and he was fantastic. I agree. Okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. He's he's one of my favorite writers um, in this because the, that kind of thinking, and it's it's one of the major things that I'm interested in as well. Is is you know people who say higher education has always been exactly the same, and sometimes they have characteristics for what it's been like since the very beginning. That's mm -hmm. almost always wrong really, really wrong. Well, thank you for the question. Thank you for the admirably concise answer. Um, and uh, and we'll actually show you how to find David's uh, video uh, at the end of the program today. Oh, good, thanks. Now, speaking of the end of the program, which is approaching, um, this is the time where we try to look more and more to the future. And we have two questions. I'm just going to flash them both up because they they balance each other. I wanted to honor both of them for, uh, for asking. Uh, one of them comes from another previous guest, uh, Brad Wheeler, Indiana, who says, you reference mergers and closures as an end to end against institutions. What is your foresight for more frequent closures or mergers and your views on that? <laughs> Hang on one second, because keep that, the question is almost is so close to this question, which comes from London, from Anna Marie Borg, who asks, how does the past history impact the future of higher ed? Where do you see us going? So two future-oriented thoughts for you. I see more flux and more change. How's that for a non-answer? Um, uh, you know, the, the the closures, mergers, and shifting is um, has spiked, and it will continue to do so because we haven't yet completely played out the 2008 uh -huh. session. Uh -huh. That is... is still having an impact because all of those institutions that got pushed to the edge then have done the dance since then of finding every way of saving themselves. And, you know, that's still playing out, but obviously the impact of, of COVID and the pandemic and, um, and the tightening of economies around the world uh, is, is going to drive this much higher. 
And so, you know, we have more institutions of higher education uh, in this country and Britain and others, all sorts of institutions uh, that didn't used to be colleges and universities were made so in the United States in the 40s and 50s and 60s in Britain in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, under Thatcherism, there was an expansion of the number of institutions that were designated as universities. And so, you know, there's a lot more play for loss. Um, uh, there are a lot more institutions around. And even if we, we expand toward older people and so forth, the number of people who are going to be searching for a basic degree education, especially if they have to pay it, especially if they have to pay top dollar, that that's shrunk. And so especially the weaker institutions, by which I mean the ones that have always mostly been local and don't have a local population to sustain it, certainly the ones that are tuition dependent, uh, those that have lost their external support base, um, will be gone and will merge. Some of that happens in the private sector, mm -hmm. but the public sector is driving it too, because as everybody here knows, um, in the United States at least, the amount of support, the proportionate support that the public has given to higher education over the course of the past decades has, has been ravaged. Um, and that is not going to do any of us any good. Uh, the, the great scholar of this is Chris Newfield, um, who just crossed the Atlantic himself, from California to uh, Britain. Um, I recommend his The Great Mistake, and also he was a fantastic guest on this program a couple of years ago. Um, can, can I just ask a, a, a question to amplify Brad's point about mergers? In, in your paper, you say several times that Defining closure is kind of tricky because sometimes a closure means something is folded into another institution, uh, like Wheelock, um, and and so that's like closure, but it's you know the people may persist. That kind of thing. I mean, do you do, do you think we'll see? Do we, we'll actually see public uh, higher education mergers as well? You know, oh yeah, look, there are a couple of new systems again. I'm going to forget who I saw in the newspaper. Maybe somebody else will remember a, a couple of more states that are thinking of making systems. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's a merger, yeah. um, uh, often not as radically merged as, say, Wisconsin did it in the 1970s. Um, there are different kinds of systems, but but there is some conversation about merging the systems, including integrating the four years, the research mm -hmm. institutions and the two years. There are some benefits to that. Um, I was involved in what I think was a wonderful program of trying to do more articulation between the two-year and tribal colleges in Wisconsin mm -hmm. and Madison. And yeah. I'm actually pretty proud of being involved in those articulation agreements. Um, but some of them, you know, some institutions just get buried in others. Becker College. Mm -hmm. It's two most successful programs, gaming and I forget what, um, are being eaten by Clark University, my alma mater, oh. which is very interesting because Clark is one of those small, um, very tuition-driven institutions that has to think very carefully about how it's going to survive. And so they're taking on these very applied programs. Well, that's a Thank you both uh, for those questions, and, and thank you for that great tour of the horizon. Uh, we have a couple more questions. I'll make sure we give everyone a chance before we run completely out of time. And one of them comes from video from Greg Shuckman at the Education Commission, the State's Commission. Uh, hello, Greg. Hang on a second. Oh, Greg, where are you Good coming to see you, from? Brian. Where are you today? So uh, I am in, I'm in Maryland and enjoying this gorgeous weather that we're having here outdoors. So Very good. Uh, Very good. Yeah. So Dr. Sapira and, and and Brian sort of got to the question I was asking about about the future of publics because that's how you ended your paper was uh, that it was for another time. But since for the less selective publics, um, they're so demographic driven by by who's within a 150 mile radius or so of them. 
what do you think is more important, the demographic changes in their communities or the state funding subsidies? State funding. I think the state funding is really crucial um, for the comprehensives um, and also the community colleges, the local county and, and state funding. And, and those are areas that just need so much rethinking um, because they, they are going to be much more the engines of mobility than most of the university campuses that are um, research universities and draw nationally because they can be more selective. They, uh, they offer so much more in some ways, so much more value added. I mean, I've spent my career at, at the research ones, but, but the comprehensives are value added in such important ways. But not only have they been strapped, but those are where students take out loans that they default on. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that anybody who's looked at this stuff, the major research institutions, the prestigious ones, the ones that get rich kids, uh, our students may take out big loans, but they pay them back because they can pay them back because of the lack of mobility in the system. The people who get strapped are the comprehensive students where the graduation rate is no better than 33%. They have big loans and they may not be able to pay them back because they haven't graduated. And so there, I think, is the one of the biggest crimes of our system is um, to make those unattractive and unuseful um, and to soak the students in a way in weird ways for a few dollars, almost as badly as some of the, the for-profits do. Thank you. Thanks. A great question, Greg. Uh, it is. Gina, thank you for the for the excellent answer. We have time for one quick last question, and this is a big one from Heather McMorrow, and I think this is a great one to, to end on. How can higher education better make the case for its place in society? And how can we help refute the current cultural belief that private industry is the sole or primary driver in a successful economy? It's a great question, and it has been since the 18th century. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, it, it really has been. Uh, you see it again and again and again with folks out there thinking, you know, get out in the world and do something. It's private industry that that makes the difference and not higher education. Um, I think we do have to keep um, keep adapting to the times and changing, even when we talk about the core liberal arts and sciences. Those are not the same as they were 50 years ago or 100 or 200 years ago. So we continue to adapt what they look like, but we have to be thoughtful so that we're still holding on to our basic understanding of what an education is for. We have to be, those of us at the prestige institutions have to be not snooty about what it is we do and what we offer. Um, and how it gets integrated with, quote, the real world. We have to use our alumni base um, in very important ways and, and keep finding new ways of telling the story. But in, in, you know, over 200 years, that case has never been fully convincing to a lot of people. It probably never will be. Mm. And so there's a degree to which we have to just keep buckling down yeah. and thinking about how we can do education and relate to our surrounding society in the best ways we can and how we can make the best difference we possibly can in the community. What a fantastic answer. And, and, and Heather, what a terrific question. And I think that is a perfect way to, uh, to, to end today. I, I hate to wrap things up, but we are at the top of the hour again, and we have to thank you, Professor Sapiro, for being a fantastic, fantastic guest. It was uh, fun. A delight having you here. What's the, how can we keep up with your work in, uh, in New Hampshire as you write? Should we just wait to hear until the book hits press, or is there anything? Uh, so I have two, two places to find out more about me. Um, I have a website, which is um, 
uh, I will send it uh, this information to you and you can ship it out to people, but blogs, BU slash V Sapiro mm -hmm. has a lot of my stuff and all of that. Um, I'm also doing a regular blog right now called the retirement letters dot wordpress.com uh on july 1st last year i started a blog that will end on june 30th uh yes uh this year where i am reflecting on 45 years of being a scholar teacher higher ed administrator and gadfly um and if people are more interested they can take a look at that and we can be in touch fantastic Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, good luck with the writing. And please enjoy spring in New Hampshire for us. Thank you. And thank all of you for coming and for your questions. They were great. They are great. But don't go, friends. I just want to let you know what's happening over the next couple of weeks. And um, on the second, of course, Gina's motion of complimenting you for these fantastic questions. Uh, looking ahead for the next few weeks, we've got sessions on uh, a game that helps you think about ed tech, emerging ed tech um, on campus about improving equity uh, in education for black students, as well as a session on accreditation. If you'd like to go uh, learn more or keep these conversations going rather, uh, we have spaces on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Slack. Uh, Facebook, I'm sorry, Twitter is usually the place to go. If you'd like to go back into the past and look at our previous 250 recordings, including some of the sessions that were mentioned today, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive uh, and please uh, subscribe so that we can uh, keep doing this. Uh, in the meantime, thanks to everybody. Uh, thanks for your fantastic, wide-ranging, thoughtful questions. This has been a great session. Above all, please, all of you, take care of yourselves. I just got my second uh, vaccine, so I am good to go. I hope all of you can be as well. In the meantime, we'll see you next time, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>